Hello, IPEM friends. When I came to the foundation, uh, as I talk about in the report, the portfolio was not performing up to expectations. And uh, I was curious because the portfolio actually had venture capital firms that I was familiar with from my time as a venture capital investor. They were firms that had great reputations and were considered market leaders, but they weren't generating the returns that I had perceived. I think that most people perceived. So, you know, what we did at the foundation was really dive in and do a lot of quantitative analysis of the portfolio and its performance over time. I think what was unusual about what we did is we, we published the results of that. The major finding was that generating VC rates of return is hard <laughs> and very few firms are able to do that, certainly consistently. At the time, uh, you know, we were saying that a venture capital rate of return is a minimum of a two times capital net of all fees and carry or 20% IRR. But really what we look at is venture capital's ability to meaningfully outperform the public equity markets. Another key finding was that venture capital compensation can bring about a lot of economic misalignment between VC investors and institutional investors that invest in their funds. It can also bring about misalignment between VCs and entrepreneurs. We also talked about longer VC fund lives and how that also makes it challenging. Uh, to generate those venture rates of return. One of the most significant things that PME or public market equivalent really has become an industry standard in terms of measurement. So if you look at industry reports or academic reports that come out about the VC industry, they always include a measure of how well VC or VC funds do at outperforming the public markets. GP commits have uh, increased. You know, one of the things that we talked about in the report is that GPs often did not invest meaningfully in their own funds. It was hard to justify that. We thought was more aligning was if GPs actually had more of their own personal skin in the game. And I think as a result of that, we saw a lot more investors asking GPs about their commitments to their own funds and the GP response was to increase those. And finally, I think there's a lot more questions in due diligence about VC firm economics and really understanding what goes on at the firm level in terms of compensation and carry. And those questions are all really positive. So a lot of good changes, I think, came out of the report. What hasn't changed is I think it's still really hard to generate great venture capital rates of return. To be successful, you have to select, you know, a few really good top managers. Early stage venture does tend to outperform. And in, in many ways, that makes sense. You know, you're in early, you're at the lowest valuation point, and you have the most runway to capture the gains from successful companies that are able to grow and scale. Certainly as companies have stayed private longer and have continued to raise additional rounds of financing, we've seen prices in the later stage, valuations and prices increase significantly. So if you were an early investor in what eventually becomes a highly successful company, you have the opportunity to capture the most outsized returns. The rounds of financing have gotten much larger. At the later stage, the valuations have increased. So bigger rounds at higher prices. What that means is you have to be really clear on what is the exit. How are we going to generate an attractive return on those later stage rounds that becomes very dependent on the exit market? So far, the IPO market has held up. And I think an interesting development 
has been the explosion in the growth of SPACs and also in direct listings. One of the things I wonder and think about is, does that actually make late stage investing uh, more attractive because you've de-risked the, the reliance on the IPO process as the singular way to generate a really attractive exit? Does that give those companies more flexibility, more resiliency, more optionality? And does that therefore make late stage investing more attractive than it might have been without those options? Traditionally, the best returns have come from American VC firms. I haven't seen that change yet, but I will say that we are active investors in Europe and, and globally, um, and the European VC industry has undergone meaningful transformation, even in just the past half decade. Uh, there's much more capital available. There are many now uh, successful companies including unicorns that have executed really successful exits, whether it's IPOs or mergers and acquisitions, um, which has meant that there are serial entrepreneurs as well as a much broader talent pool of early stage, uh, you know, entrepreneurial workers that are available and interested in building companies. So I think the European ecosystem is really coming into its own and is looking more attractive every year for investment opportunities. In the US, we're seeing a movement towards much greater levels of investing outside of the coast. So beyond Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, we're starting to see firms that focus on traditionally underserved areas, including the middle of the country. I think it's really exciting to finally see um, the very earliest signs of increasing diversity in venture capital. There are many more firms that are founded by women, by minority investors, or include women and minority investors on the senior investment team. I think that's a hugely exciting development in the industry. Many VC firms already had a, an investment roadmap in that area, the future of work or the future of labor. But I think now everybody is on board with that as a result of this pandemic. The other sector that I think is really interesting, which um, hasn't fully come into its own yet, is ag tech and food. I think there are many problems in those uh, industries and sectors that need to be solved. We're starting to see traditional capital come into those sectors at the kind of low hanging fruit level versus the solving fundamental problems levels. Um, but I think that's a really interesting area as well. When you manage a private equity portfolio, the key is to invest consistently across cycles. That's kind of the recipe for generating the best returns. So the priority is to keep investing, to uh, identify, you know, the best managers and to find those emerging managers that will become the best managers. And an area that we have found really exciting is uh, spinouts, where you have somebody who was at a more established, larger private equity or VC firm. They already have a track record. They already have experience executing a particular investment strategy. They spin out, go out on their own. So you have the combination of that experience coupled with the hunger and the economic alignment and the small fund size of a relatively new VC firm or private equity firm. If you think about work as a sector, it is ripe for disruption. So I think there's enormous opportunity uh, for investors as we kind of play out the future of work over the next one, three, five year periods. What does that look like and where are the opportunities for investment? What will remote work look like and where will it take place? How will companies be disrupted. There are many implications that come out of changing the way that we work. And I think there's enormous investment opportunities there.